All right, welcome back to CS50. This is the end of week five, and this is one of my favorite problem sets that's on the horizon here. So if some of you have kind of been staring at this, trying to figure out what it is, letting your eyes zone in and zone out, odds are you didn't quite decipher it. But if you had, say, from childhood, one of these pieces of plastic that came, for instance, with one of these cereal top boxes, and you held it up to this thing, what you would see, as did last year's students when they implemented this idea in code, was that it was Professor Plum in the lounge with the candlestick with this particular murder mystery. And so on the horizon for you this year is going to be a little someone different and a little someplace different with a little something different. But this is a teaser for problem set five, whose focus will be forensics and the recovery of information that's either been accidentally or deliberately lost. Uh, I went through my. Uh, inbox to retrieve an email from one of your predecessors. I'll uh, keep it anonymous, but this was really quite fun to read since he sent this to us a few months after CS50 ended a year ago. And he wrote us yesterday, my sister accidentally formatted her camera's digital media card and lost a year's worth of memorable photos. Parenthetically, she unfortunately isn't the best at backing up her data. Uh, this reminded me of problem set five, so I thought I would try to run her memory card through the recover.c program that I wrote all the way back in October. October. So after four hours of figuring out how to create a raw forensic image from the formatted memory card, I uh, came across uh, this page and was able to do the following. After tinkering around with some of the command line arguments, I managed to create the forensic image. I installed and configured the CS50 virtual box. I managed to run the forensic image through my program and run all, uh, recover all 1,027 of my sister's photos. I find it absolutely amazing that. I was able to go from being one of those less comfortable with no programming knowledge whatsoever to having the ability to recover data off of a formatted memory card in an actual real life situation. So it does, in fact, happen. So this will be problem set five. So a uh, quick invitation, uh, CS50 lunch at the usual place, cs50.net slash RSVP this Friday at 1.15 PM. Um, we're going to do a dinner in future weeks for those who consistently cannot make Fridays, FYI. And now let's turn our attention back to this library. So very briefly, last time we looked at this function getString. We've been taking this for advantage, uh, taking, it, uh, taking this for granted for some time now. And underneath the hood, recall that it's starting to, it's actually been using some of these new fundamentals we looked at. This notion of memory management, dynamically allocating memory. And just as a quick review, so the function we introduced with which you can ask the operating system for memory is now called okay, malloc for memory allocation. And that memory ends up on stack or heap. So it ends up on the heap. And the intuitive explanation for that is that the stack memory constantly is coming and going. It's disappearing every time a function finishes executing. So it stands to reason that a function like getString, if you want whatever memory it's allocating to actually survive its return, which you do, otherwise what's the point in getting a string, that memory needs to go onto the heap. So henceforth, and we'll see this more in future P sets, when you actually want memory dynamically, in other words, you don't know how much you need in advance. And that's absolutely the case when you have no idea what the human's going to type until he or she does. Or if you want to dynamically grow or shrink something, you're not just going to declare local variables anymore. We're going to start using a function called malloc. And it comes with an opposite function called free, which is a function we'll start to need to call when you want to tell the operating system, I am done with this memory. In fact, a little dirty secret of the CS50 library is that currently it leaks memory, whereby every time you call getString, we call that function malloc, asking the OS for memory, asking the OS for memory. But never once, probably, for your problem sets, and even in lecture, have we said to the operating system, I'm done with this string. You can have these bytes back. And so that's actually a bug. It's a bug that's been in the CS50 library from the beginning of the semester, but it's meant to simplify the process so that we can just assume that we're getting a string. But now, as we begin to dismantle these training wheels, any time we actually ask the OS for memory, we're going to need to give it back. And so we're going to stop using the get string function, since now we can appreciate, perhaps, that it's not quite doing us uh, a huge number of favors. Now, just as an aside, what do we mean by, what do we care about memory leaks for? Well, if you've ever been running your Mac or PC or Ubuntu computer or whatever you have, and you find that over time, it's getting slower and slower, and you're opening things like uh, Gchat or your browser or Photoshop or whatever programs you typically run, and you've been doing this 
a lot, loading things into memory, quitting, loading. Well, if any of those programs has one of these things called a memory leak, where some programmer just screwed up and asked the OS for memory, but didn't necessarily hand it back, what can happen in real terms is that your computer can slow down because your OS is going to think that it's out of RAM. And so future programs are going to use something called virtual memory, which for today's purposes is slower. So if you're ever finding that your computer is inexplicably getting slower and slower and slower, it might just be, frankly, that you need to reboot because there's some buggy program or programs that haven't quite been playing nicely. Inside of your laptop. So let's take a quick look at the CS50 library. This is CS50.C. We started looking at this last time, and it's okay if you don't quite understand all of the intricacies of getString, but a function that is a little easier is something called getInt. And it turns out that getLong, getLongLong, they're all pretty much equivalently implemented just for different data types, and they all conveniently use getString. So let's assume for the moment that getString works and it allocates memory. For us, and it ultimately hands us back a line of text that the user has typed in. So here is the implementation of getInt that we've used as far back as week one in problem set one in C. So I first have kind of a curious feature here. I am deliberately inducing an infinite loop. While true means do this forever. So hopefully, somewhere in this loop, I have a break statement or a return statement, something that's going to deliberately break me out of this infinite loop. So let's see what I'm trying to do potentially infinitely. So I have in the inside of this loop, I'm going to try to get a line of text. So this is a familiar call. I'm now checking recall for line equals equals null. So as an example, when might get string return this special keyword null? Yeah, so if there was nothing typed in, and we can simulate that as we've discussed with Control D, which normal humans aren't likely to type, but there's another scenario that could very well happen, and we'd get back null. If too long a string, right? If they paste in a huge essay that would fully exhaust the computer's RAM, get string, in as much as it calls malloc, might end up returning this special pointer value called null, which essentially means ugh, something bad happened. I don't know what necessarily, but I can't give you back a string. So we have to check for this. Otherwise, we risk later in our program those things called seg faults and core dumps. Now, why am I returning int max? Well, this is just a convention in C. There's kind of this problem fundamentally in C. Anytime you're implementing a function that's supposed to return a number, like an integer, because you can return you know, upwards of 2 billion positive numbers, maybe as big as negative 2 billion. But if you want to return an error, you kind of have to arbitrarily say, OK, 0 represents an error. But then that's problematic, because if you want your function, like getInt, to be able to legitimately return a 0, if the user typed in 0, well, you can't use 0 as your special error value. So you can say, all right, let's use negative 1. If the user, uh, if, the, uh, if something goes wrong, we'll return negative 1 by default. But that too is problematic. What if the user wants to type in negative 1? So the convention that most functions in C adopt is they don't choose these popular values like negative 1, 0, and 1. They'll choose like 2 billion and 1, something that's crazy large and just shy of the maximum possible value. And we define that typically with a constant. So if we actually poked around a bunch of .h files in the appliance, we would see that someone had done sharp define int max, and it's something like 2 billion. And so we're kind of deciding, yes, we're sacrificing that number, but it's less likely to be useful than 0 or negative 1 or 2. So that's why we're returning int max just as a matter of convention. Now here's where things get interesting, and here's where the training wheels now come off. So this final chunk of code, this big branch here, is how get int ultimately works. And it uses a function that you may have seen in readings or other examples called sscanf, which means in string scan formatted. So it's kind of like the opposite of printf. Printf obviously prints, scanf reads in from the keyboard. So if we didn't have the CS50 library, you're seeing the hoops you would have needed to jump through in week one just to do something stupid like ask the user for a number. So how does this actually work? Well, notice first. Just for temporary variables, I'm declaring an int n and a character c. And I ultimately want to put the number that the user types in into n. c, I just need to check if the user screws up. I need a character for the following reason. Here is the magical function. sscanf takes a few arguments. The first argument is the line of text that the user typed in. So look at a string that the user typed in. And recall from above, we called getString and we called the return value line. So that's all this is. This is literally the array of characters, aka string, that the user typed in. So we're saying to scanf, scan this string 
and try to extract an integer for us. But how do we do that? Well, much like printf, which is used for output, scanf does this for input. We say in, parent, we say in quote marks, percent %d, which is a placeholder saying, try to fill this placeholder with an actual integer that the user typed in that's inside of this string called line. We have a white space character to the left. And a white space character in the right, to the right, just to be friendly, so that if the user accidentally hits the space bar, then a number, that's OK. Or they hit a number and then the space bar, that's OK. We're going to forgive that. But we're not going to forgive typing any character other than a space. If the user types in 42 space F or G or any letter of the alphabet or symbol on the keyboard, What's going to happen is this. Scanf is also being told, all right, put the first number you see into this placeholder, but put the first character you see, alphabetical character, punctuation character that you see in what variable, apparently? In C. So this is just here as a bit of error detection. We only want to fill N. But just in case the user messes with us and we also happen to fill C, we want to be able to detect that the user typed not just a number, but also a number and a letter of some sort. So we have to tell Scanf where to put those variables. And it is not correct, certainly, to do this, because anytime you pass a variable into a function, how are you passing it? What's the jargon? So, you're passing it by so called value. You're passing a copy of it in. But if you want scanf, scanf, to be able to fill those variables with the, some new values, how do you do that? Well, you have to write down that little scrap of paper, the visual we keep doing, where you have to say to scanf, put your answer on these two sheets of paper. So, here is ampersand d, here is, or rather, ampersand n, here is ampersand c. Put your int here, put your character here, because then I, the person who wrote this code, is going to check if. S scanf returns one, that's perfect. What, the return value of scanf signifies how many pieces of paper that function filled with value. So if it only filled one, the int called n, great, we're good to go. We can immediately free the line, the string that the user typed in, and that's new today, and then we immediately return that integer. But if the user somehow did not cooperate, did not just type a number like 42, and instead we get back from S scanf the number 2, which signifies that they typed in some number plus some garbage character, or if S scanf returns 0 because they didn't type in anything somehow, the else condition is going to apply. We're still going to free that line, that string that we got from the user, and then we're going to nag them retry, retry, retry. So if you've ever kind of wondered how that retry is being spit out automatically for you if the user doesn't cooperate, It's right there. Every one of these functions, get int, get float, get double, has that retry line. And if you don't get there, but instead the user cooperates, you instead return the int or the float or the double or the like. So those are the training wheels that are henceforth off. Questions? If it, uh, so no, it has, to, good question. So if, it, if the user just typed a character, Would it not still return 1? No. Then it would return 0, because when you have the format string percent %d, percent %c, that's telling scanf you have to try to put a number, then a letter. So if the user only puts a letter, doesn't match that pattern, so scanf returns 0. So good, good corner case. Yeah? Why are we going until it was true? So when you return the number, it returned as true? Or...? Uh, so, no, good question, too. So while true, Is kind of a sort of a vacuous truth. It, true is always true. So while true just runs forever, no matter what. You are, there's no way to break out of this loop unless you manually return from the inside of it. Now, we don't have to do it this way. In fact, it's usually wrong to induce an infinite loop. It usually means you messed up and you made some mistake. But in this case, we could have used a do while, we could have used a for loop. But in this case, we decided as the staff, we don't want to say we're going to let the user try 100 times, in which case we'd have a for loop with the Number 100 hard coded. And we also notice did not want to prompt the user initially and say, saying something silly like give me an integer. We wanted to leave that to you guys, the ability to actually put that first printf. The only printf we wanted to spit out was the retry. So we just decided that really what we want, really the construct that gets the job done, is just do the following forever, but we'll stop ourselves when we're ready. So it's just a design decision. Yeah? So what if you type in a number? 
Good question. So, what if you type in a number and a character? So, scanf actually treats white space inside of that second argument special.、Um, if you actually did that, it would ignore,、uh, it would still put number and then letter. You don't need to have the white space there. So, that is a, it's sort of a, sort of a secret feature whereby this space is optional. It would return two in that case. If you typed in 42F, for instance, you get the 42 and the F, but that would still be wrong. Yeah?、Uh, if the while、uh, loop runs every time you call get in, then why do all our programs crash?、Uh, why do your programs crash? What do you mean? Why do they not crash? Why do they not crash? Yeah, because if you were calling get in and get in causes infinite loops. Ah, good question. So, why do your programs not so much crash, but why don't they hang and just kind of sit there waiting in perpetuity? Well, remember, getString is actually the function that's first getting called, and it's getString that sits there with that blinking prompt waiting for input. And so, if the user doesn't ever type anything or even hit Control D, absolutely, your program's just going to sit there and run infinitely long. But getString is actually what pauses this loop and waits with a blinking prompt for the user's input. Good question. All right. so... Scanf, let's actually see this is how we might use this manually. So, this is an example. It's among today's printouts and online. This is an example called scanf1, and it demonstrates how you can, sort of old school style, get an integer from the user if you don't have the CS50 library. And it actually is relatively simple if all you want to get is an int from the user. Of these exceptions of the user not cooperating aside, but it gets a little dangerous if we're not trying to get ints, but we're trying to get characters or strings. Because recall, we've revealed that strings involve pointers, pointers involve memory, memory involves the risk, at least, of screwing up and inducing core dumps and seg faults. So we're about to see that. So here is a program whose purpose in life is to say to the user, give me a number, please. Then I have already declared a local variable called x, and I'm passing it in by reference, so to speak, by pointer. By address, these are all synonymous phrases, to a function called scanf, and scanf reads directly from the keyboard. S scanf, string scanf, reads from a string that you already have in a variable, as we did earlier. Scanf reads directly from the user's keyboard, which is the goal right now. So, right now, the user is being prompted for an integer, and if the user provides an integer, it's going to be stored inside of the variable x, and it's going to be printed back out on the screen. So, let's try this. Let me go ahead and do make. Scanf1. All right, it seemed to compile OK. I'm going to go ahead and run Scanf1, and I'm going to type in the number 42. Thanks for the 42. It seems to work. So let's try it again. Let's uh, try uh, the number, let's say, 0. Always try the interesting cases. That seems to work. Let's try the number negative 1. That seems to work. Let's try the arbitrary word I latched onto this term, monkey. Hmm, something <laughs> went wrong here. So what happened? Can we infer from this short program? What the bug now is. Yeah. OK, good, good thought. So perhaps it's converting the int to the chars. All right, so, other, so、uh, maybe. So actually, no, but let's see some other ideas. <laughs> but that's a good thought. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, a good, it's a good thought, but it is indeed this case whereby, because scanf did not detect an integer, it in instead detected a word, a character, m in particular, it could not populate the placeholder. And so nothing was put in x. So its original value is unchanged. And what is x's original value, apparently? Well, it's just. Who knows? It's some garbage value. And that garbage value at that moment in time happened to be 2719732. Who knows what it might have been? So, this is another takeaway here, too. If there's ever a risk in a program where your variables might not be assigned some value, it's actually a good habit just to detect such things to, for instance, initialize your variables to some known value. Maybe it's 0, maybe it's negative 1, maybe it's int max, but so that you yourself can check afterward what actually. Whether or not the value in there is legitimate. So realize this is absolutely an option. And so if there's ever a risk, again, of your variables not getting initialized, you might want to pre initialize it yourself to what we keep calling a sentinel value, just some special number or special constant. Well, 
this is relatively straightforward for ints, but let's look at version two here at trying to get a string. Let's just continue this logic. So we've taken the training wheels off. I have removed the CS50 library from my appliance, and so I cannot anymore say include CS50.h. And so I instead, if I want to declare a string, I have to go back to the old fashioned way of saying char star. So char star buffer is going to represent my string. And I'm calling this a buffer deliberately. In my mind, A string really is an array, and an array is just a chunk of memory. And computer scientists would typically call a chunk of memory a buffer, something into which you can read values, and characters, numbers, whatever. So a buffer typically means an array of memory. But notice here that really what I've declared is char star buffer. So just to be proactive here, how much space have I actually allocated with this first line of code here? How many bytes or how many bits have just been allocated by char star buffer? So it's pretty small, right? How big is a char star? It is what the question reduces to. It's, it's generally 32 bits, right? So anytime we have a pointer, we've claimed, at least for the appliance and for slightly older computers, a pointer is always 32 bits. So, what does that mean? Char star buffer? All I've allocated is 32 bits. And what's supposed to go inside of those bits? Not a string. That's not really a buffer. That's kind of a misnomer at this point in the story because really I only have a pointer and I'm not supposed to put characters in pointers. I'm supposed to put memory addresses in pointers. So, even if this still feels a little abstract, at least take away from this that、mm, something here is wrong. And as an aside, just to tie this together, if you're pretty computer savvy and you've known it for some time that, for instance, your PC、um, can only have two gigabytes maximally of RAM, you might be generally aware of these restrictions. Well,、uh, two gigabytes is actually、um, a result of having a 32 bit CPU. Intel inside, if it's 32 bits, the biggest possible number you can express is. 2 to the 32, which is 4 billion, but for technical reasons, that's actually half. So you have 31 bits that you can use to address your RAM. So, long story short, you can't have more than 2 gigabytes of me memory in some computer because you don't have numbers big enough to actually say, put this here, put this here. You kind of can't count that high, even if you had 10 gigabytes of memory. So, another reason that having a 64 bit computer these days, as most of you now probably do, is actually a very good thing. So, the,、um, so C doesn't have a native stream class, but does it have? Correct. So、uh, C does not have a native string class like something like Java does, but it does know about strings in the sense of printf. But it really treats them as arrays of characters and it stops when it sees backslash zero. So it's very primitive in that sense. So what do I say? I say to the user, string please, and then I use scanf percent s buffer. So I'm saying to scanf, take whatever the user just typed in at his or her keyboard and then put it where? At that memory address. Now, what is that memory address? Well, what is the value of buffer at this point in the story? It's, it's a garbage value, right? The answer to this question is always going to be it's just some unknown garbage value if I and none of my code has not initialized it to anything explicit. So, what you're really saying is you're allocating only 32 bits. For a、uh, pointer to a character, and that's got the number like OX1234. You are then handing this slip of paper to Scanf and saying, put whatever the user types here. Well, what's there? Well, you have no idea. It could be zero, it could be one, two, three, four, five, it could be some part of memory that you don't even have access to. So, Scanf is going to erroneously put the string there, which typically induces one of those seg faults. So, let's see if we can confirm this. So, let me go ahead and make Scanf2. And always keep in mind that some of these. Errors are not detectable because you get lucky and you actually touch memory that is yours, but you really shouldn't be using it. Now, we've configured make in such a way that you can't、uh, even compile this code because we are proactively checking wait a minute, buffer is uninitialized in this function, and so there's an error. Won't let it, me even compile. But let me see if I can manually override this. Rather than type make, I'm instead going to do GCC. Uh, dash standards equals C99. This is just the version of C we're using. And I'm going to skip the dash W error, which is the guy that's making、uh, make be so picky. Scanf2.c dash O scanf2. Enter. So now I'm going to run scanf2. So it compiled, even though I know there's a bug in this program. Let's go ahead and run it. String please, monkey, enter. 
segmentation fault. So what's a possible solution here? Well, I can at least initialize this to some null known value. When the convention is typically null, let me go ahead and recompile this. But notice, even if I do this, this is no better. It's still buggy, but at least now printf is detecting as much in this case. So still a bug, but at least now it's obvious to you, the human, the programmer, wait a minute, this is clearly not what I expected. I'm doing something wrong. So what's the solution perhaps to this? What do, how do we fix this problem of buffer being some unknown value? You know, can I do something a little crazy like, well, null is obviously bad. I know that much. Well, let's put it at this address I keep quoting as popular. Well, we could do that, but what you're really saying, now you're just arbitrarily saying put what the user types over there. And you have no idea where there is. So what function can we call that gives me a memory address of a legitimate chunk of memory? All so, right, so the solution here is malloc. So we could try this. So give me a string that's of size, oh, the user's not going to type in a word that's more than like 10 characters. So I'm going to hard code 10. Now this should actually work because malloc, assuming there's RAM left in the computer, is going to give me a pointer and it's going to say put this word that the user types here in memory and that address is now stored in buffer so scanf will put it there. Now let me go ahead and try compiling this. Let me recompile it with gcc. Oh, implicit declaration of function malloc. So we've not had to do this manually yet because the, libra the CS50 library is usually doing this for us, but there's another header that's popular, standard lib, standard library.h, and that should make GCC happy now not knowing about malloc. And indeed it did. So scanf2, and go ahead and type monkey. Nice. Thanks for the monkey. All right, but wait a minute. Uh, monkey, 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 enter. Interesting. So that kind of worked, but monkey, 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 with no spaces. Interesting. But what's happening here actually is that we are getting lucky. Let me see if I can make us unlucky by doing this ad nauseum. Let's see. Well, that doesn't work. So let's do paste. Let's do paste. Let's do paste. Let's do zoom out. Let's do paste. Now, obviously, a user is not typically going to do something like this, but imagine it's actually, you know, a form field on a web page where, oh, it's still working. So <laughs> I'm getting a little bored copying and pasting, but take my word for it today um, that if we did this long enough, we would traverse one of those segmentation barriers where right now we're within it and we're just getting lucky, but we're going to cross over it at some point, and in fact, it's going to crash on us. Again, segmentation fault. So how do you fix this? Well, this is actually harder to fix. And now the, is the CS50 libraries get string function motivated. Recall we looked at it briefly on Monday. And any time you call get string, how many characters does it get at a time? Well, recall it used a new function, get character, get char, and it just got one at a time, one at a time. It's incredibly paranoid, the get string function that we wrote, so that it only slowly looks at what the user's typing in, and only if it realizes, wait a minute, you just typed in 11 characters, but I've only allocated 10 bytes, what is it going to do? Well, recall we saw briefly the realloc function, which is like a cousin of malloc, and realloc, as its name suggests, takes the 10 bytes that you might have already allocated with malloc and doubles it. Or triples it, and we repeat this process. So why was getString relatively complex compared to this? For this simple reason. There are so many programs to this day written out there where the, the programmer has made an arbitrary and ultimately dangerous decision to say, no one's going to have a name longer than 16 characters or 1,000 characters. But these are precisely the opportunities that bad guys look for trying to crash programs because, again, we saw on Monday this opportunity for a buffer overflow exploit, which essentially means typing something a little more sophisticated than monkey, 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 but rather code that you want to execute and you can trick the computer into overflowing this buffer and executing your adversarial code. Yeah? The word string does not exist. It's in cs50.h. Uh, good, good question. Coincidence. So percent %s is part of C. It's part of printf. And percent %s, so the word string exists in programmer's vocabulary, but the data type string does not exist in C. So percent %s denotes char star. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
really good question. So I'm contradicting myself here, right? In the previous example with, S, with scanf1, recall that I did this. I per, passed in per, uh, ampersand x to get the address of x. But we can kind of answer this just with our own jargon. What is buffer already? It's a memory address, so I don't need to use ampersand because I already have the answer to the question. The question is going to be where do you want me to put the user's input? Well, put it at that address. And the fundamental difference here is that in the previous example, we allocated an int. It was on the、uh, stack as a local variable. There was no malloc involved. But as soon as you involve malloc, what you're literally getting is that address. So we don't need to use the ampersand in this case. And realize there's one other way we can create a buffer that's just as dangerous as hard coding a length. A very common approach in a program is to say something like char buffer bracket 16. So char buffer 16 doesn't feel like a memory address really, but it is in fact an array of characters. And what though is an array? Well, an array really is just the address of the first chunk of memory. So, what is this really doing? This also is allocating not 10, but 16 bytes this time. It's then passing the word of the name of the array, buffer, to scanf. And think back now to pset 3 when you implemented sort or search. Remember that you could pass in an array as an argument to a function, and you didn't use the double brackets. You instead just wrote the array's name. That's because you can pass an array by its name, by its address. And so scanf here would use that 16 byte buffer to put the user's input. But what's going to happen if the user types in 17 characters? Just by nature, by definition, you're going to go beyond the boundaries of that array. And notice, too, in C, scanf and your own code has no idea how big the original array is. It has no idea how many bytes you asked malloc for. It is entirely up to you, the programmer, to remember how many bytes you asked for or how many bytes you hard coded in the array. And so, again, this is the One of the primary reasons that so much code written in C and C, and even in some modern languages, is in fact、uh, exploitable、um, because of these kinds of dangers. And if you don't believe that too, realize that these languages that you might already know a little bit, we certainly will by semester's end, like JavaScript and PHP and Python and Ruby, a lot of the times the programs called interpreters that you use to use those languages. They're written in C themselves. So you might be writing PHP code, but it's being executed by a C program. So if that C program is buggy, your PHP code can be vulnerable as well. Yeah? So、uh, Good question. So if the buffer is an address, why do we not say star buffer as we did in our swap function on Monday? So the reason, again, boils down to the fundamental question we're trying to answer here. The question at hand for scanf is where do you want me to put the user's input? The answer to that question must be an address, but we already have an address. Malloc gave us an address. So the simple answer to why we need no star and no ampersand here is because buffer is already an address. Because in this case, we called malloc. And as, we're, as I'm、uh, disclosing today,、uh, the name of an array can be treated as though it is a pointer as well, an address. The only time we use the star is when we want to go there. Scanf will do star buffer. We do not.、Uh, yeah. So 16 characters. 16, character. 16 of whatever the data type is in green. Uh, no, it's still going to be 16 bytes. A char is one byte. It's eight bits. So in this case, we would get literally 16 bytes or 16 chars. If it instead were int buffer 16, then we would get 64, because it'd be four bytes per integer. All right. All right. So recall then the danger that this leads to.、Right? We saw this picture, and we kind of lambasted this design because you have this dangerous pointer called the return address in red, and that was simply the address of what? What was this red return address used for? It tells a function what? This is the return address. It's literally return address. It tells a function where it should return control of the computer to once it's done doing its thing. So if I'm the main function and I call the foo function, what I'm essentially doing conceptually is I main. I'm going to say I am address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You hand this piece of paper to foo. Foo keeps it around in this red slice of memory. And as soon as foo is done executing, it checks where did main tell me to go back to? 1, 2, 3, 4. Let me hand control to the CPU back to the address that was on this piece of paper. But the 
problem is that if foo has an, a buffer, say 16 bytes, or in this case 12 bytes, and the user types in not hello, but something much longer than that, where does the space go? It goes from top left to bottom. And so you run the risk ultimately of overwriting this with the address of. Some bad guy's code. And unfortunately, even though the simple solution might be to just say, all right, well, don't write hello from top down, write it from bottom up. Turns out that only makes the problem a little harder for the bad guys. But the problem is that you can end up tricking future functions that gets called、uh, into exploiting code. So there's actually not a simple fix for this. And again, this remains one of the most common ways of exploiting a program. Let's just peel back the layer of one other thing with regard to pointers. So, this here is a program called pointers.c. It's among our, print, uh, our、uh, source code from today already. Notice that I'm using a few header files up here, using a few libraries, just because I wanted to resort to the CS50 library for this. And now, notice the one new habit I'm getting into is anytime I call getString, I now need to say if the return value equals equals null. Something went wrong. I should yell at the user. I should、uh, return. I should exit. So I'm now checking that value. Now, why can get string return null? Because it uses malloc, and malloc can return null. All right, so notice this trick, though. We have previously printed strings, and previously the syntax had been this.、Right? This should probably remind you a little bit of week one, week two. If you want to print a string that the user's typed in, it should remind you of pset2, the Caesar cipher in Visionaire. Well, I can print each character, percent %c, one at a time. And then I can print that character by way of s, the name of the string, bracket i. So comfort with this, hopefully. So it turns out that all this time, these square brackets are what we would generally call syntactic sugar. It's just a nicer, prettier way of doing something that, at the end of the day, is actually more sophisticated. This code here that I just wrote is equivalent to s bracket one. So let's go back to the fundamentals. First of all, what is s? Well, s we call a string, but really, as of this week, what is s in more technical terms? It's an address, right? It is the address in RAM at which that string. Characters live from left to right. So, star s, recall, means go there. And if you go to that address, you're going to see the letter m, and then o, and then n, and then k if the word is monkey, right? If you go to that address, you're going to see those characters. But you don't want to go to the same address every time. You want to go to the start of the string, which is identified by the name s. But each time you iterate in this loop, how many steps to the right in memory do you want to look? Well, i, right? One more, one more, one more. So if inside of your loop you take this address, s, and you add i to it, well, the first time this loop goes through, i is initialized to what, apparently? Zero. So s plus zero is s. So what are you going to print first? You're going to print star s, which means go to that address and print out, if the word is monkey, the letter m. If you then take that same address and do plus one on your second iteration, that's not address one, two, three, four. That's like one, two, three, five. And what letter presumably is at that location? So O. So star of that summation means print the O, print the N, print the K, and so forth. And because we already checked in advance the length of S with this helpful function string length, we're not going to crash. We're only going to step over the characters one at a time and then we're going to stop. But just realize all this time, Even as far back as problem set two in Caesar, we've been using pointers. We've been using memory addresses. We've been walking through your computer's RAM, but we did it in a more user friendly way with s bracket i. But really, you've been using a feature called pointer arithmetic taking an address and doing some mathematical arithmetic on it, plus one, minus one. So realize all we've been doing is the same topic all this time. Yeah? Really good question. So, if we were instead iterating not over characters, which are one byte typically, but instead over ints, would we have to do plus four times i so that we go four bytes, four bytes, four bytes? Short answer no. The reason this feature has its own name, pointer arithmetic, is because the compiler will figure out that when you say s plus i, If s is actually a char star, it's going to do literally plus one. If instead, though, s is an int star, well, an int star points to an int by definition. Ints on this machine are four bytes, so plus one is actually going to be implicitly converted to plus four, then plus eight, plus 12, plus 16. So that's what's really cool about pointer arithmetic. You don't even have to think about those details. So your code will work on old machines, new machines, because the compiler will figure this out for you. Really good catch. All right. Yeah. 
Good question. Is this more computationally efficient than using square brackets?、Uh, no. The compiler will actually effectively turn your square brackets into this. So when your code's running, you will notice no difference.、Um, back in the day, you might notice a compilation difference, but these days on a 2 gigahertz computer, compiling Caesar is instantaneous anyway. So it's a non issue in modern times. All right, so that was a lot. Let's go ahead and take our five minute musical break here. All right, so we are back. Really good news. No problem set next week. <laughs> I know. There it goes.、Um, so, yeah, so Quiz Zero is next Wednesday. There's no lecture on Monday because it's a holiday for the universities. Quiz Zero is on Wednesday. We will announce via email on the course's website where to go next Wednesday. We're going to try to book enough classrooms so that we have writing surfaces for everyone. So, we most likely will not be here. So, again, don't show up before checking your email. There will be a review session this Sunday at 7 p.m. in Northwest Science, same time, same place as the walkthroughs usually are. This will be a course wide review. It will be filmed, put online by the next day、uh, to cover.、Uh, Uh, really, the past six weeks of material and particularly field questions from you.、Um, we'll also have office hours next week on Monday and Tuesday night.、Uh, they most likely will not be in the dining halls. They'll instead be in a classroom where we can use a whiteboard and they'll be totally casual and an opportunity to get some last minute questions、uh, answered.、Um, know too that there's four years worth of old quizzes on the course's website. So, the best guidance for to get a sense of what past quizzes have been like is to go there and you'll see not just Just the questions, but also the answers. Do just realize that the course evolves over time. For instance, in 07, we had three quizzes. Thereafter, it was just two, but the material changes. So realize that if you have no idea how to answer some question on the quiz, that's either because you zoned out at some point this semester or we just never talked about it this semester. So look ultimately to the syllabus and to the lecture slides and scribe notes in particular for guidance. And so if you've not realized this, it's always fascinating at the end of the semester in the Q guide to read that people are unaware to these. Scribe notes. So, we have a wonderful teaching fellow who actually trans,、uh, summarizes what goes on in class each day, typically with snarky、uh, little footnotes, which you might enjoy. And so, this is meant to be a, an authoritative set of notes in lieu of your own, potentially, if you'd rather not so much scribble things down. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Very apropos. So, realize these two are meant to be a very good guidance、uh, through the course. And I would strongly urge, too, when you do show up at Um, office hours and or the course review session. Honestly, you'll be doing yourself a service if you spend at least a little bit of time this weekend taking a past quiz so that you're not being hit with material for the first time. You can rather make better use of your time and ask questions only about the stuff you are forgetting or、uh, struggling with.、Um, also, We put online these things. We have been transcribing、uh, all of the course's lectures as promised, so that now when you visit past lectures' videos, you will see not just the course's video on the left, you will also see every word that came out of my mouth, for better or for worse, and you will be able to hit play. And just to give you a sense of what you too will be able to do by semester's end,、right. well, the little JavaScript, the you can even read what I'm saying in real time as it highlights as the words come out of my mouth, and even subtitle it if you would prefer to watch in that fashion. So, this also means, too, more compellingly, that you can search, control F and so forth, looking for topics like pointers, looking for arrays, things that you might have struggled with. You can actually find that point in the lecture, scroll down to that spot, click on a specific sentence, and the lecture will immediately jump. To that point in the class. So realize that's there, and we will finish by the weekend today's and Monday's lecture so that you have access to those online before the quiz. So I also got curious as to what words do actually come out of my mouth.、Um, and so I uploaded them to a nice free tool online that creates a visualization of the words that you've pasted in. And the bigger the word, the bigger the font, the more times I said it, the smaller the word, or if it's not even there, the fewer times I said it. And this, for instance, was this year's very first lecture.、Um, It's kind of curious. I say the word just a lot,、um, actually a lot, course, that makes sense. CS50 is a little smaller there. I was worried I was saying Facebook too much the first week, but that's actually pretty small at the top right. So that was reassuring. I then fast forwarded a few weeks, and some themes definitely popped out、uh, just <laughs> again, and gonna. So I didn't realize I sound so intellectual in class.、Um, and then I looked at yet another week, and like, just is the theme. <laughs> So now I'm never going to be able to say this word without kind of tripping over myself, but apparently that is the most popular takeaway or word that I say in CS50. So,、um, hi. 
So、uh, one exciting initiative that the university across all of Harvard schools has been working on, you may have read about it at some point in the Crimson, is the Harvard Innovation Lab. This is a beautiful new space across the river, right next to HBS, that has a few floors to it. The top two are being used by HBS classes. The bottom floor is meant to be an innovation space for undergraduates, GSAS students, HBS students, students from all across the university who have entrepreneurial ideas, who have projects they want to work on、uh, collaboratively with friends, and they just need space to work, and they want to be around. Other smart people doing interesting things, technical people, so as to ask and to answer questions. And so, just to give you a sense of the space, it has literally just opened in the past few days. When you walk across the river, you'll see a building like this. You go in, it's very modern and high tech, concrete floors, nice lighting, funky seating, and so forth, and a lot, a lot, a lot of workspace. What we thought we'd do for fun, even though it is across the river, so it's a little farther than Leverett and Quincy and, and Foho and、uh, Lowell. Is for just one week, not next week, but the week after for problem set five. Is we've been cordially invited as a class to spend office hours there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday.、Um, pizza and soda will be served throughout the evening.、Uh, the shuttles will run back and forth between campus, and it's actually not that far a walk, but just emotionally, we'll make sure that you can hop on a shuttle and to actually get there.、Um, but it should be a fun CS50 field trip to see a couple of hundred of us uh, uh, working on P set five in the Harvard Innovation Lab as its inaugural class. So more on. That I'm sure over time. So we set the stage on Monday for. Forensics and focusing on a problem domain, albeit using these same fundamentals of recovering information or covering your tracks when trying to get rid of information. To begin to discuss how information is actually stored on something like a hard drive, we actually need to be able to represent the data on a hard drive in actual programmatic terms. So, just as a flashback, you might recall from week zero what is actually inside of a hard drive. We'll just watch the first part of this for a few seconds. Recall that. This was the story. Is where your PC stores most of its permanent data. To do that, the data travels from RAM along with software signals that tell the hard drive how to store that data. The hard drive circuits translate those signals into voltage fluctuations. These, in turn, control the hard drive's moving parts. Some of the few moving parts left in the modern computer. Some of the signals control a motor which spins metal-coated platters. Your data is actually stored on these platters. Other signals move the read-write heads to read or write data on the platters. This machinery is so precise that a human hair couldn't even pass between the heads in spinning platters. Yet it all works at terrific speeds. So the film recall goes on to just discuss.、Um, this is going to be a little. Messing with your mind.、Uh, if we could focus the、uh, camera on the board here for a moment.、Um, so you'll recall that the video went on, perhaps, to show those little blue and red magnetic particles, and to reduce the problem of storing information on a hard drive to the orientation of magnetic particles, either north-south or south-north, thereby representing one or zero, respectively. Some system like that. Well, what's really going on in a computer's hard drive is obviously got to be higher level than that. There's got to be some notion of file names, some notion of file sizes, some notion of folders in which things are. So hard drives are not just zeros and ones. Rather, they actually have some metadata stored on them. And metadata means data, but it's useful for other data you really care about. So let me just draw, for instance, the, one of those platters. So this is a metal disk that's inside of a typical hard drive, and it spins around generally at thousands of times per minute. And all along here are zeros and ones in some orientation. Now, what's really going on there is that clusters of these zeros and ones represent more interesting things. They represent your actual files, like your MP3s and your movies, but also things like the file name and where things are. So it turns out, even though this might represent Some movie you've downloaded from iTunes. There's a special part of the hard drive reserved for a table, sort of an Excel spreadsheet of sorts that has, to oversimplify, two columns. On the left is the name of the file, and on the right is the address of the file. So just like we can say that your RAM can be addressed from byte zero, one, two, three, four on up, similarly can your hard drive, even though it's a circle, be Described in the same way. This is byte zero. This is byte one, two, three, four, and some system along those lines. So, how does your computer remember where data on your hard drive is? It uses this little cheat sheet. So, when you create or save or download a file, there's this table in your operating system's memory that says, "Okay, you just downloaded、uh, movie.mov," some file name like that. And so, the name gets written in the left column. In the right column, gets written the address of, say, the first 
byte of that movie. Now, hard drives are actually pretty fancy, and so you can get what's called disk fragmentation. If you've got big files, they might not necessarily all end up here. You might get part of your movie here, or here, or here, or here. So, if you've ever heard this term, defragment your hard drive, it's referring to the fact that your file might be spread out. So, it's not sufficient just to remember the starting address of a file. Turns out there's usually a list of addresses. Part one is here, part two is here, and so forth. But now, into the world of Forensics. What happens when you actually drag a file to the recycle bin or to the trash can on, on Mac OS or Windows? So you probably figured this much out, right? Like, what happens when you just drag it to that, that special icon? Don't forget the address. Yeah, and actually, not even there. In fact, we can rewind further. Nothing happens, right? If you drag a file, something sketchy or private that you want to delete, and you just put it in the recycle bin or the trash can, hopefully by now you figured out that your roommate can just double click your trash can or your recycle bin, right? So you actually have to do what? So empty the recycle bin or empty the trash can in some way. But what really happens? Well, despite years worth of our being trained by computer society, computer society that, that deleting means deleting, deleting does not mean deleting, right? So deleting means Forgetting. So, what really happens if you've got some、uh, financial data or some you know, Dear John letter you didn't mean to send or you wanted to delete or something you don't want found? Well, if you delete it by dragging it to the recycle bin and clicking empty recycle bin or empty trash, all that's happening in this picture is that the operating system just forgets where it is. Now, anyone Who's versed in the art of forensics, or anyone who has Google, can find a program that can then search your hard drive looking for what we'll call signatures of known files. It turns out a lot of files on the internet and in general have signatures, which just means they're identifiable by just a few bytes. For instance, if you detect this sequence of bytes on a hard disk,、uh, FFD8. FFE0, and these are just hexadecimal numbers. If you detect that on a hard drive, that means with very high probability you have just encountered the start of a JPEG. A JPEG is an image, a photograph. These are very commonly deleted from one's hard drive. And so you probably don't want it to be so easy for someone to just search your entire hard drive with an automated program and say, JPEG, 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 JPEG. But indeed, this is what forensic investigators do. I mean, this is what your roommate could be doing if he or she Googles for such tools. You can recover files from a hard drive with very high probability because literally the bits are still there. And just because your computer forgot about them doesn't mean there's not enough hints scattered around your hard drive to recover them. So that then begs the question OK, how do I really delete these files from my hard drive? Right, so, what do you do? Or what do you need to do technically, intuitively? Yeah? After I delete all my like, dirty pictures, I could upload a bunch of, I could download a bunch of episodes of The Sopranos. OK. You have a very concrete plan B here. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, after you delete your sketchy photos, you can download some very big、uh, Sopranos episodes online. And that's actually quite clever. That would have the side effect of overwriting your sketchy photos because even though your computer's forgotten that these files are there, as soon as you start downloading a huge amount of content, big movie files like Sopranos episodes, with high probability, these zeros and ones, they're not going to get erased per se, but they're going to get reused. Those magnetic particles are now going to be part of some Sopranos episodes. Episode, so now 50% of your sketchy behavior is now gone. right? So if you've ever used something like Norton Utilities or any of these programs that undelete files, what they'll sometimes say,、oh, we can delete this file with 95% certainty. Well, that probably means because 5% of the zeros and ones have been reused by a Sopranos episode or the like. Now, thankfully, there's even easier ways. This is sort of the like, oh my God, I really have to cover my tracks, download a lot of content. Thankfully, there do exist built in ways, and different operating systems do this better. If you've never known Noticed, though you've had this probably if you own a Mac for some time, under your Finder menu, there's empty trash, but there's also secure empty trash. So, secure empty trash will not only erase what's in this table, it will also overwrite the zeros and ones with it minimally. All zeros. And there are Department of Defense standards that actually say, well, you can overwrite the bits with zeros and ones randomly, some seven times, even more times than that.、Um, the research literature,、uh, there has been no published evidence that simply writing all zeros over your data on modern hard drives is insufficient. So you probably don't.
don't need to use Department of Defense standards to actually cover your tracks, whatever it is you're trying to delete. It generally suffices to overwrite zeros and ones.、Um, and this isn't a Mac versus PC thing, but Apple has been much, much better in recent years at making this easy. On Windows, to my knowledge, there's no such super simple option as that. In fact, in Mac OS 2, and it's maybe fine because we're preaching to the choir since most of you, a majority, have Macs,、um, you can also encrypt your whole hard drive. The thing called File Vault means all of your data is actually encrypted. So if it's lost or stolen, no one can actually see what your files are. They just look completely random. And there's even, if you're super paranoid,、uh, something called secure virtual memory. Long story short, when I mentioned earlier that your computer might slow down sometimes because you're loading lots of programs, well, Typically, a modern operating system will not say, like it used to,、mm -mm, you have too many programs running. I will not launch Safari again, or I will not launch Internet Explorer. Instead, what it will do is create the illusion that you don't have maximally two gigs of RAM. The computer will pretend that you have three gigabytes of RAM. And to create that illusion, it will take one gigabyte's worth of programs and files you have open, temporarily copy them from RAM to your hard drive somewhere, and then voila, you have a gigabyte that you can use for new programs. But Which is slower, RAM or hard drives? Well, the short answer is a hard drive is generally something mechanical, though this is becoming less and less true. Anything mechanical is going to be slower than anything electronic, and RAM is purely electronic. So, one of the reasons your computer slows down when you're doing lots of things is because you're using virtual memory, hard disk space as though it were RAM. But here's the security worry. Even if you're good about deleting your browser's cache and you even empty securely your recycle bin or trash can, it doesn't matter because those sketchy photos you had open in your program. Might have been temporarily put into virtual memory, which means put into some special part of the hard disk that you don't have easy access to delete. So, unless you enable something, and I think if I go in a Mac, system preferences, security,、uh, general, yeah. So, it's grayed out right now, but this option here, use secure virtual memory, is checked here by default. That means that even your virtual memory is encrypted. So,、um, we'll come back to this in problem set five, but realize that there's a lot of、um, ways to both cover or accidentally leave uncovered. Your tracks. But we need now some way of representing structures like this. Up until now, the only kinds of data structures we've had are things like chars and ints and floats and slightly more fancy arrays. But even an array has just been a contiguous sequence of ints or chars. But what if we actually want to represent something like a table like this or a file or maybe even more familiarly,、um, a student? And a student might have a name and an ID. Or you can imagine any number of real world entities that would be nice. To kind of represent with your new custom、uh, data type. So we can actually do this. So this is a file this week called struct.h. And notice what you can do here. There's a new keyword that we've actually seen before, but we're using it now proactively for the first time called typedef, and another one called struct. And even though this is slightly new syntax, what this chunk of code means is declare a new type, similar in spirit to int and float, but a custom one. Whose structure looks like that. Inside of apparently a struct that's going to be called student is an integer called ID, a string called name, and a string called house. So I could literally write string, but again, I'm trying to take off the training wheels of the CS50 library. But this here means give me a new variable type. Called student, inside of which are three things. Now, why is this useful? Well, let me open up this file, structs1.c. If I scroll down here, notice a couple of things. One, I'm kind of including some familiar, friendly things because I want to use get string and some other stuff, printf and the like. But notice this too. Now that I have my own header file, as we've had in some of our own P sets, I have to include my own file. And anytime you're including a file you wrote, you use quotes. Anytime you're using a file someone else wrote, you use angled brackets. So that's the one subtlety there. I'm apparently using this trick called a constant so that the total number of students in this program is three. And let's Before we look at the code, just look at what this thing's going to do. So, this is structs1. So, let me go into my code and do make structs1. Let me go ahead and run structs1. All right, so a student's ID is one, student's name is David, Mather, student's ID is two. Let's say this is Rob, this is Kirkland, and three, this is Matt, this is Kirkland. OK, <laughs> that's the only thing I did with this program, right? David's in Mather. So, how did we do this, right? So clearly, we threw away two thirds of the information we collected here. But what's actually going on? How did I store these? Now, to take a step back, you could totally implement this program in like week 
one, right? You could have nine variables student ID, one, student name, one, student house, one. Then you could have student ID, two, student house, two, student name, two. And then you could just kind of come up with some arbitrary convention like numbering your variables, but you'd have nine of them. And conceptually, this should hopefully start to rub you the wrong way. This is a little inelegant. Just to store three real world entities like teaching staff, I now need nine variables and I need to give them all separate names. I'd kind of like to have a variable called student one, student two, student three, something super simple inside of which are the nitty gritty details. So that's exactly what we're doing here. Notice if I scroll down to my main program here, notice in my main function, I first declare an array. Of students. And I can now use jargon that just sounds more natural to me. I want a student、uh, data variable. I'm going to call this a class of students. And how many do I want? Well, this is just three. Remember that we hard coded that up above. So this means give me an array of three students and call that array class, which is just kind of consistent with the idea. Here's a for loop that iterates from zero to three. And then I just use some familiar functions. I use get int and get string and get string. But notice the syntax. This is one new piece of syntax, and that's it. To get the ith student in the class, I do class bracket i. But if I want to go inside of that student structure and say, Edit its ID number, I just say dot, or I say dot name, or I say dot house. So, this is a way of kind of clumping up together multiple variables an int, a char star, a char star, but thinking of them and programming them as though they're one bigger entity, like a student, but still having access to all the nitty, ditty,、uh, nitty gritty details. So, here's how only I was printed. If I iterate then over all of these students again in the array, recall this function string comparison. So, if The ith students in the class, house equals quote unquote mather, and I check that by checking for equal to equal to zero. Remember, that's what the string comparison does. It says zero if they're equal. I print out David or whoever is in mather. And how do I get at David's name? Class bracket i dot name. But there is one thing I have to do now to get into this habit. Notice at the very bottom, and I had this in my last example, I call free. Free is the opposite of malloc. Any, any, any time you call malloc, it is up to you and it's expected of you to call free at some point. Not right away, because that would kind of defeat the purpose, but eventually, before you actually exit your program or return from main. So, what I'm doing here is I'm freeing name and house for all three students, but I'm not freeing ID. Why? Because what?、Oh, I think you're right. I just can't hear you. Okay, oh, so, okay, so I didn't print it, but why did I make a conscious decision not to free ID? I didn't use malloc. It's as simple as that. Because in my H file, notice my header file, because in my header file I said that a student is an int and a char star and a house, notice there's no malloc here, but I did assign to name and house the return value of what function? Get string. Get string uses malloc. And so here too is this dirty little secret that I、uh, admitted to earlier. All this time we've been writing technically buggy programs. But the upside is my God, we didn't have to think about or talk about pointers in the first week. We could just use get string and get a string from the user. But now anytime you call get string, which will soon be no more, or ultimately call malloc, you have to free memory. Otherwise your program will quote unquote leak. And that generally results in slowdowns and it ultimately、um, involves incorrectness of programs. So, I thought I would、um, disclose or emphasize all the more with a concrete example、uh, what is and is not possible in popular culture、um, in terms of technical shows like this. So, I dug out a 30 or so second clip from an actual TV show. We'll then counterbalance it with what really would happen had they consulted anyone remotely technical before shooting this episode. So, here we go. Back one. What do you see? Bring his face up. Full screen. His glasses. There's a reflection. That's the new Evita's baseball team. That's their logo. And he's talking to whoever's wearing that jacket. Okay. <laughs> so, anytime you hear someone say, again, can you clean that up? Can you enhance that?、Mm-mm, you can't. If you see a little glimmer in someone's eye, for instance, Rob's, 
and you try to zoom in on that little white speck of some reflection there, as I can do with some consumer program. Let's call it Photoshop. Let me drag suspect.jpg into Photoshop.、Um, I'm going to zoom in on something suspicious here in his eye, and I'm going to zoom, and I'm going to zoom, and I'm going to zoom. OK, a y so that glimmer in his eye, as well as CSI's eye, two pixels of color. This is what happens when you enhance an actual image in reality. So I give you Rob Bowden's eye. This is CS50, end of week five. We will see you next week. <laughs>